Hello and welcome to the Car Kernel channel. In today's video, I'm going to continue my series on how Toyota and Lexus engine controls work. In today's video, we're going to be talking about long and short fuel trims, what they mean, how they are, how to look at them for diagnosis, and also at the end of the video, we're going to dedicate a good portion of this video actually to look at some live data and look at everything that we have learned in this series and how it actually looks in the real world. But before we get started, if you're new to the channel, welcome. Make sure you catch up on this series. If you're not a subscriber, consider subscribing to the channel. Check out some of my other videos. If you're a returning subscriber, thank you so much for watching another one of my videos. And without further ado, let's dig right into it. Let's start with fuel trim, what it is, what it means, what it does, and how it is calculated. So there's two kinds of fuel trim. There is a long fuel trim and there's short fuel trim. Fuel trim is not an actual reading. It is a calculated number based off everything that the computer is doing with fuel. Is it adding fuel or is it cutting fuel from a preset zero. The long fuel trim is more of a general area where the computer is. Like let's say, the best way to explain this is a, a little bit of an unconventional method. Bear with me here. Let's say you have a beautiful dog. Now that dog's on a leash. You are holding the dog with your leash. That dog is running in this area right here. Like, let's dedicate this area. Your dog is running wild in this area and you're just standing in your place. I am the long fuel trim. The dog is a short fuel trim. He's running around wild in this area, but then all of a sudden, the dog pulls you to another direction that you're not standing. Now he's stretching you far. After a little bit of while of pulling, you're gonna move. And once you're going to move to a place where the dog is happy and now he's running wild in front of you. Now that we have this a little mental note, let's talk about the fuel trim. So the short fuel trim, before we dig into it, do you remember when I told you that in the series that the computer is always making micro adjustments to the fuel, always doing that dance back and forth with the, with the AF sensor where, oh, we're adding too much fuel, let's cut back the fuel. Oh, now you're adding too much, let's, you're cutting too much, let's add some more, and it just keeps going back and forth. Well, the fuel, fuel trim, or the short fuel trim, will actually demonstrate that. You'll see the short fuel trim will be, every time it wants to add, the short fuel trim will go positive. Every time it wants to cut fuel, it's gonna go negative. The long-term fuel trim is what window is the computer adding in? What general bracket? Let's think of it this way. You have 10% fuel trim. The short trim is going around that 10%. It's going negative five, positive five, negative five. So it's essentially going negative five long trim, positive five. And it's just going back and forth, but the long trim stands at 10%. But when all of a sudden your short trim goes to one way and it stays there, that means I'm not happy with your 10% long term, let's move. So when the long term moves to let's say 0% instead of 10, and then the short term is happy, now it's switching back and forth again, everything is happy. Another way to put this, and this, is, this gets a little complicated to understand, but we're gonna try to, I'm gonna try to simplify this. Your long term, term, just like the word says, long term, it's gonna give you a general idea of where your fuel trims are at, how much generally you're adding or taking away from fuel. The short trim is really not great for diagnosis, only in very few cases, because the short trim will be moving all over the place, constantly, it's just going back and forth, making those micro adjustments. The long term is more of those big changes. Let's talk about diagnosis a little bit for fuel trim, because this is where it really explains everything. So let's say you have a car with a lean code. Well, most people associate a lean code with low fuel or 
vacuum leak or something of that nature. But when they look at the fuel trim, they're going to expect to see a negative number. Well, a negative number means the computer is cutting fuel. That's the opposite of what the computer would do when you have a lean condition. When you have a lean condition, you have more air than fuel. So the computer is going to try to compensate for that by adding fuel. So your fuel trim will be positive. So I want you to keep that mental image in your head that lean will cause a positive fuel trim, rich will cause a negative fuel trim because that's just the natural reaction of the computer trying to compensate for these conditions. So when there is a problem, let's say you have a massive vacuum leak and we're going to simulate that later on. So the computer is going to do this. This is exactly how the picture you will see. There is a vacuum leak. The computer will start, let's say the fuel trim at idle is 5%. Hypothetically speaking here, the, the vacuum leak started. The short trim will go to positive 20 and stay there. It won't move at all. The long trim will be, the computer will look at that and go, okay, well, let's move the long trim. It's going to move the long trim to 15%. Still, the short term is 20%. Is going to move it to 25 and the short term is still doesn't want to move so it's going to keep going as soon as it enters that 20 25 27 percent positive it's going to not like it and it knows there's a problem because that's way too much compensation and it's going to shut everything down and it's going to set a code and now it's no longer doing the dancing game that's it it can no longer maintain a healthy air fuel ratio so it's the same thing with, with a rich condition. It's just going to go on the negative side. So what I want you to take from this is, and this is a, this is folks, everybody asks me about this. I get so many emails. Oh, I'm looking at my fuel trim. It's all over the place. And then when I let it idle, it's at five. I want to bring it back to zero. Folks, don't chase after a zero number because it's just not going to happen. Yeah, some cars you will have zero, but remember, the computer will compensate for a lot of conditions, normal conditions like altitude, like high temperature, low temperature, slightly worn engine, slightly dirty air filter, slightly dirty mass airflow. And yes, you can chase after all these, but is it worth it? The computer is able to compensate for all these conditions. So you do not want to chase after a fuel trim that is slightly elevated or slightly low. You just, that's the normal way. That's why there is, that's called a computer learned memory. It's going to learn how to make this engine in our conditions, altitude, weather, fuel quality, all kinds of many factors, how to make this engine run at perfect stoichiometric. So when you look at the fuel trim and it's 5%, well, that's normal. As long as your short is cycling, that's normal because that's just how the computer is compensating to keep this engine running optimally. And one thing about fuel trim, which is vital, fuel trim is not the same at idle and at every RPM. At every different RPM and load range, there's something called load range. How much loads on the engine? Are you just revving the engine at idle when the car is stopped? Or are you revving the engine when you're going 60 miles an hour? That's, there's a difference there. There's a load when you're going 60 miles an hour and there's no load when you're sitting idling. So the fuel trim off idle is an unreliable way to check fuel trim because at every RPM level, at every load level, there is going to be a different fuel trim. That is, that is called a map. The computer will learn the different conditions of the engine and it'll have a different fuel trim for every RPM condition and load condition. So when you rev the engine and you're driving, you look at the fuel trim, it's all over the place. It's constantly changing the long and the short because at every different condition, it's changing up, down, up, down, left, right. So don't look at it when you're driving. That's a common mistake. In Toyotas, you only want to look at your fuel trim when you're fully warmed up, you're in closed loop, and you are idling the engine with preferably no load. The more load you put, like AC on, lights on, you start putting loads, it's gonna start changing potentially. But with no loads, that's when you wanna look at your fuel trim. If you have an issue, if you don't have an issue, why are we looking at the fuel trim? So it's the long trim is positive five or negative five. 
That's not an issue. That's just a normal compensation. And you notice some of the older ones, if you disconnect the battery over 30 minutes, that goes resets back to zero and the car will run kind of weird until it settles because now it doesn't have that compensation for whatever condition you're in and it's gonna run odd until it finds its barrier and gets finds its bearing and finds that perfect level where it needs to be to run everything optimally. Having said that, don't read too much into fuel trims. Fuel trims are not an actual reading. They're a calculated number to make things simpler for diagnosis standpoint. If you have a lean condition, you're gonna see it. As soon as you fix that lean condition, you're gonna see, like let's say you have the, the talk where we talked about with the lean condition. As soon as you fix that lean condition that before your long trim was 30% and your short trim was still at 30, as soon as you fix the leak and you start the car again, you're gonna see that short trim go negative 30 immediately. And it's gonna stay that there until your long drops, 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 until it gets, let's say, to that hypothetical 5%, and now it's cycling back and forth and life is good. Sometimes, when you're looking at data in a scan tool, you're not gonna see the short trim cycle as much. It's just gonna be like positive, negative, and then it'll stay at zero and then positive, negative, because it's cycling so quick, you're not gonna see it in the scan tool. The scan tool doesn't refresh fast enough. So having, that, having said all that, having said everything in this series, let's dive in and look at some actual live data from a car. So this is the live data from TextStream. Before we get started, I would like to give you just a general outline of what everything is. So we got fuel system status number one, number two, this is bank one and bank two. OL is open loop, closed loop is CL, and there's something called open loop drive. We'll get to that when we get to that. Then we got coolant temperature. This is a cold car. We're gonna do a cold start to see what happens exactly when you cold start the car. So you got 34 degrees Fahrenheit. This is a cold car in a cold Chicago night. Engine speed, zero RPM, engine's not running yet. Injector port, zero milliseconds. The injectors are not spraying. Remember the injector direction, duration we talked about? Right now the engine is off, it's zero. Short fuel trim, bank one, sensor one. They're always gonna say sensor one, but this is for bank one, zero. Long trim, 16%. It's just, that's the value it wants to start with. But remember, all these engines will run at new rich and condition. That's just a normal thing. So it's already prepared for that. 16% is gonna slam it with fuel. And then the short fuel trim on bank two. This is a V6, by the way, that we're looking at. So it has two banks. The short fuel trim on bank two is zero. It's not adjusting it because the engine is not running. Long fuel trim is 11. You notice that there's a difference in the number. That's, again, it's compensating for different things. And this is a, is a learned value. How much do we need the fuel trim to be at, at this amount of temperature and a cold start? That's why it needs all this input. You're gonna notice that the air fuel ratio sensor, both bank one and bank two, they're reading 3.3. I know it says 3.29, but this is actually 3.3. It has no reading at this point, so the computer is just putting a default value. And the O2 sensors are at zero. O2 sensors typically will not read until they really warm up. So I want you to observe when we start this car, I'm gonna run the clip, I want you to observe how long it takes and you're gonna learn through diagnosis and when you start looking at a lot of this data to really jump around and look at multiple data at the same time. It's gonna happen too much, you can go back and look at this video multiple times. But I want you to observe how long it's gonna take for it to go into closed loop? How long is it gonna take for it to actually, the, once it goes into closed loop, how the, how the AF sensor will be right before you go into closed loop, how it'll be all over the place. It'll be in two volts and reading all kinds of weird numbers. But as soon as it goes into closed loop, it starts reading right. And you're gonna notice as soon as it goes into closed loop, your short fuel trim is gonna start pulling the fuel back. That's just the natural thing it's gonna do because it's gonna, as soon as it goes to closed loop, now we're working, we're listening to the sensors, just like we said. So having said that, let's watch the cold start. Here we go, we got ignition. You notice that the AF sensors are not doing much. There's not really much movement. We're still in open loop. The RPM is high, the fuel injector milliseconds are very high because now we're in rich. Look at the AF sensor, it's all over the place. It's two volts, 
it's reading way too rich, but it's still not accurate. We went into closed loop. See, this thing happens so quick. You see how quick this happened? Now look at what's happening to your f short fuel trims on both banks. It's in the negative. It's trying to pull that long fuel trim back. It's slowly going to pull it back, pull it back, and then your, a your AF sensors are reading low still. They're not at 3.3 because now it's, it's running rich because of that cold start enrichment. After some time, when you notice the idle is dropping back, you remember when you start your engine, idle comes up, then after some time, your idle starts settling down. See, the idle is still a little high, but it's settling. You see your air fuel ratio, now it's starting to hit that 3.3 and it's going back and forth, and your fuel trims are starting slowly to come down. And it's still, look at the short fuel trim, it's negative. It's just saying, okay, we're done with the fuel enrichment, let's bring it back down and slowly it'll start moving back. But right now, your air fuel ratio sensor is hitting its target. It's hitting that 3.3, so it's, it's somewhat happy with it, but it's still, it knows it's still in the, in the warm-up process, although it's closed loop. But look at your, look at your injector pulse, your injector duration. It dropped, it used to be at four when we started. This means that we were starting very rich and now we dropped down. Let's look at another data. Now the car is fully warmed up. We have 178 degree Fahrenheit coolant temperature. That's warmed up. You haven't started driving yet. We look at our injector uh, duration. It's 2.17. It's, it's there. It, remember it dropped from four when we first cold started it. Now we have O2 sensor readings. By the way, this is not live yet your fuel trims are still somewhat elevated for this car, but again, don't read too much into it. This is a perfectly fine and healthy car. What we're looking at here is, you remember when I told you the air fuel ratio sensors will do that dance? It's gonna go, okay, we're too lean now, they were too rich, too lean, too rich, and it's just gonna keep going back and the computer is adjusting back and forth. So here's how that actually looks live. Do you see those up-down motions? So this is, one of them is bank one, and one of them is bank two, these are the air fuel ratio. If you look at the actual reading, you're not really seeing it change much, but in reality, it is all over the place. Do you see how much is changing on the graph? That's how much, that little micro adjustments, that's all it takes. When you look at it in a graph, that's how you're gonna see it, that it's actually switching back and forth. So now in the next video, Car is fully warmed up, everything is fine, everything is running perfectly fine, we're at idle, about 700 RPM, we're in closed loop, I'm going to run this clip, this clip is called a snap throttle, so I'm going to push the throttle all the way down and let it go, we're all doing this in idle. I want you to see two things, actually three, I want you to watch what's going to happen to our fuel system status, are we going to still be in closed loop? And then I want you to see what's gonna to happen to our fuel trims, how they're gonna go all over the place for a second. And then I also want you to watch our AF sensors. The AF sensors don't do very well for, with that snap throttle. As the RPM is coming down, essentially the engine shut off momentarily. So it's gonna have a very erratic reading for a bit. That's why it's gonna change our fuel system status. It's gonna take it out of closed loop into, it's called open loop drive. It's gonna momentarily go into open loop just to let everything settle, then go back into closed loop. So let's run this clip. So here we are, we're at idle. Watch the RPM as well, it's gonna go up. Whoa, we went to 3000 RPM. Do you see that all over the place? There we go again. That's all, everything just went crazy and it's still, now it's settled down. Look how it stays in open loop for a bit until things settle down, then it comes back into closed loop. That's normal. I want you to know that this is a completely normal condition. I'm gonna focus at where it's, it's at its peak. You notice we went into open loop drive. We're at 2300 RPM. Your injector pulse dropped down from two to 1.28 milliseconds. Your fuel trims just kinda went but what's going on here? You got one of them jumped to 15, the other one's 11. 
And then look at your air fuel ratio sensor. Remember when I told you you should never go below three volts, never go over four? It's at 4.5. And that's the reason it goes into open loop because it expects that the air fuel ratio sensor will give a, a reading all over the place from that snap throttle, that sudden increase and decrease in RPM. That's why it goes into open loop drive. And right after that, it's gonna go into open loop a little bit, wait for everything to settle, then goes back in closed loop, starts its cycling back again. Here is another graph. I want you to see, when I told you the short fuel trim will not, you will not see it cycle as much because the, the computer doesn't have that much of a refresh rate to see those micro adjustments. But when you graph it, you're gonna see it. I want you to see the green line and the yellow line. Those are your long fuel trim. You see how they're steady and, and the red and the blue are your short trim for both banks. I'm gonna run this clip and I want you to see how it fluctuates back and forth, the short. The long doesn't really fluctuate as much. We're still warmed up. Look how much the short fluctuates and the long is just sitting there because it's going back and forth. If you notice, it's going back and forth within a small range. It's, it's changing its range back and forth, but not much is changing with the long fuel trim because this is a healthy engine that's running normally. It's making its micro adjustments, but it's not completely going out of what's, what it already have learned. So now in this next clip, we're gonna create a problem. I'm just gonna disconnect the vacuum hose. I want you to see how the computer is gonna react to all this. So let's run the clip. So right now, everything's good. We're in closed loop. I want you to watch the fuel trim. Look how sharply they jump. Whoa, our short fuel trim just jumped to 20. Did you see that? It's trying to compensate for it. So this will take a long time for it to drag the long fuel trim until it sees a problem. But right now, it is not having it. We're at 20% on the short fuel trim and it's just stuck there. It is really not having it. And look at the air fuel ratio sensor. It just jumped well over four. That's usually the first sign that there's something catastrophically wrong. It just doesn't like it. We're too, way too lean from, for what our normal range is. Usually the computer never lets, never lets the air fuel ratio go that high lean or that low rich. It usually makes that micro adjustment. That's why you wanna keep that, never let it go below three volts, never let it go over four. That's the range of normal. But right now we're at four or well over four volts on the air fuel ratio sensor and it's really not having it. Look at the long fuel trim. In just a short moment, it already went to 28. Not having it, this car is just not happy at the moment. At some point, here's what's gonna happen when this when this whole mess is you go to trouble code oh boy look what we have here po171 po174 pending it saw it didn't like it it set a pending code pending code it's gonna wait for this occurrence to happen again if it continues to see it to happen one more key cycle so you shut off the car let it warm up well let it cool down completely then start again if it still sees the same condition you got a hard current code and it's going to turn on check engine light and that's that's a two trip logic it's going to make sure that that problem was not intermittent it was not a one-time occurrence that's why it's going to flag it as pending at this point when you have pending code you have failed emissions it's done it doesn't like it it is going to take Every, every year will vary, but it might take up to 50 key cycles for that pending to move to history. So when you see history codes, that's what they mean. If you were working in a car, you disconnected the vacuum hose, oh, I left it loose, plug it in, it actually has a pending code. It's gonna take a long time for it to take it out of pending into history. So now I want you to see another scenario. That vacuum leak that we created, we're gonna fix it. So right now we're still at 28%, really not happy. Now I'm gonna plug the vacuum hose back in and look what happens. Immediately your short fuel trim went, went into the negative. Now look at your air, air fuel ratio sensor. It's coming back to normal. It's like, guys, I like what I'm seeing now. It immediately went back to normal. And your, your long fuel trim is dropping down slowly. Your short fuel trim is still in the negative. It's still trying to make these micro adjustments to get it to where it's happy. Look how rapid this thing is. So when you have a vacuum leak and you fix it, you can immediately tell when it's fixed just by looking at the fuel trim. And that's how fuel trim is useful. So we're gonna look at one more 
um, scenarios. Let's, let's simulate something. So in this one, I added some more data so, so you would see it. This is called the cylinder misfire counter. It's just gonna count how many times every revolution the cylinders misfire. This is a V6, we have six cylinders. What I'm gonna do here in this video, I unplugged a coil, an ignition coil. So effectively causing a misfire. So it's not gonna, the problem with these computers, and this will not be extremely clear, but you're gonna, you're gonna see a small misfire count and then it's gonna go away or it's gonna stay there, it's not gonna to continue to count. Because this is a newer car, by the way, the car is working on is a 2008, same one we filmed the uh, uh, coolant and the spark plug with. The computer in this one is very smart. It's just gonna shut down that cylinder. So you're not gonna keep continuing damaging that catalytic converter. And you're gonna see it here, that's why it's gonna, it's gonna count a little bit of misfire, then it's gonna stop. So let me run this clip and we'll see when that happens. But I also want you to watch the fuel system status. There it goes. You see that misfire on number six? It goes into open loop drive, it's not happy. Notice that the air fuel ratio only on one bank went south, bank two. That's where cylinder six is at. It's, it's running lean at this point and now it's settling back as it shut down that cylinder. That's how these things will react. That's how you'll start seeing, now you see they're still not even. Your banks, they will never be 100% even, but when you see that wild gap, one of them is normal and one of them is at four, you know there's something wrong. And look, it does not want to go back to, it just went back to open loop. That's it, we're not having it, we're not happy. I'm gonna pause it right here because I actually plugged it back in so you would see what happens when it continues normal operation. But you notice up to this point, there was no adjustment on the fuel trim. The minute you go into open loop, that's it, the fuel trim, we're done. We're not doing anything with the fuel trim anymore because it doesn't, it doesn't like what it's seeing. It's not gonna start making micro adjustment. It all went downhill from here. So when I plug the coil back, look how rapidly it picks that up and immediately goes back into closed loop and starts, here it is, closed loop. Everything went back, it, you still see the misfire count, but that's just, it's gonna stay there for a while. Your fuel trim started moving, your air fuel ratios are equalizing and everything going back to life. That's when you plug it back in and everything is fine. I want to show you one more thing. Now, unfortunately, when I recorded this, it didn't pick up another screen that I had. So in this can tool, there's an option in TechStream, by the way, that we're using TechStream here. Uh, there is an option for diagnosis where you can force the computer to go rich or lean, whichever way you want it to go. So in this video, I am trying to force it to go rich and force it to go lean. And I want you to see how the air fuel ratio sensor will react and how the injector pulse or duration will change. So right now, I'm gonna pause the screen right here. I am commanding the computer to run rich. So if you look, your fuel trains no longer change. But what did change is your air fuel ratio sensors. They went below three volts. That's an abnormal rich, of course. That's used for diagnosis. And if you look at your injector pulse, it went to 2.3. Usually it settles around 2, 2.1. Now it's 2.3 because it's adding too much fuel because you commanded it to do so. Now here's a top tip. If you're diagnosing with, with TechStream, of course, if you have another aftermarket scan tool that's, that could show you the same thing and have the same capability, it would work. Let's say you have a leaky injector you're diagnosing a leaky injector. Now, if you have the same screen where you show the misfire, when you command it to run rich, you're gonna see one, misfire, one cylinder start misfiring because now it is already dumping too much fuel in that one cylinder because of that bad injector is just leaking too much. And now you're asking it to add even more, that cylinder will no longer can be able to run and it's gonna start misfiring. Now, let me fast forward when things go the other way. Right here. Your injector pulse came down and now I commanded the engine to run lean. It's basically gonna cut back its injection duration 
And if you look at the air fuel ratio sensor, it's only it's elevated. It's no longer that 3.3 volts. It is at 3. Point almost 7. That's elevated. Notice your fuel trim did not change because you're commanding it. Now here's a top tip if you're diagnosing one of these. Let's say you have a clogged injector, and this is more of a likely case with Toyota, especially the older ones. To tell a clogged injector, that injector is barely putting out enough fuel to keep that cylinder running. So when you go and run it lean, you're cutting the fuel even more on that cylinder. So all of a sudden, if you have your misfire counts, you're going to start seeing one cylinder start misfiring when you, run, when you command the computer to run things lean. And that would be your bad injector right there. That's just a simple way you can use all these tools and all these methods, if you would, to diagnose. So guys, having said all that, I hope you can kind of see where this is going. You can see how simple diagnosis is done. You learn, I want you to go back and, and look at these data as we talked about it. Observe other things that I didn't talk about. There was some information there that I didn't talk about that I put purposefully so you can see how a diagnosis standpoint, from a diagnosis standpoint, things are when you're looking at just random numbers and it's like, whoa, what's going on here? But now you have an idea of what's actually going on. Why are these numbers jumping all over the place? What do they mean? What's going on? And having said all that, this will take us into the next episode of this series where we're going to talk about catalytic converters and more importantly, how to correctly diagnose them. This seems to be a big subject, so look forward for that video if that's the subject you want to see. I hope you learned something new. I know this is kind of a long video, but there was no other way to do it other than show you the live data so you would have a mental image of everything that we've talked about. I hope it was not too complicated. I know at some point things got a little out of hand, but that's how it is with data, and I hope it all comes together and you see it. I hope this video was helpful. I hope it was informative. I hope you learned something new with this. If you're not a subscriber, consider subscribing to the channel. Check out some of my other videos. And guys, until the next part of this series, may the Lord bless you and keep you, and you have a wonderful day.